I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is another installment of Convo by Design Presents West Edge Wednesday, a look back at all of the incredible programming from the 2023 edition of the West Edge Design Fair held at the Barker Hangar in Santa Monica, California. These conversations were held on the stage designed by Marbay Designs and presented by BR Home. This is installment number eight in our series entitled Next Level Design and the Future of Residential Architecture. The idea of home is evolving in response to social, environmental, and cultural changes. How do these changes and innovations affect dwellings built to accommodate current and future needs? Hear from this season panel on how modern materials, practices, and change in thoughtful design is leading to another golden age of architecture. This program features an incredible group. Alice Kim from JFAK Architects, David Paskew of Abramson Architects, Bryn Garrett of EYRC Architects, and the conversation is moderated by a friend, uh, Duan Tran of KAA uh, Design Group. Thank you to Convo by Design partners and sponsors, Thermosol, Moya Living, and Design Hardware for making the podcast possible, and thank you for listening and watching these episodes of the show. For links to all our partners, guests on this episode, West Edge Design Fair, Marbay Designs, and BR Home, please check the podcast show notes for links, and you can find that at convobydesign.com and click on the podcast tab. Thanks for watching and listening. Here's Duan Tran. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, and just a real quick shout out to you. I mean, you know, thank you for what you do, especially over these last 10 years and kind of celebrating and being a great ambassador for the design work that so many of us are involved in and giving us all a voice. So just want to say thank you for what you're doing and obviously for, for this weekend and everything. Um, so as Josh mentioned, I'm Duan Tran. I am a partner and principal at KAA Design uh, here in Los Angeles. We're a high-end residential firm that fo focuses exclusively on that work. Uh, we've been around for 35 years and we practice both architecture and landscape architecture. Um, but I'm actually very proud to be on this side of the microphone today to be part of this panel with three of my esteemed colleagues, three great architects that are doing some exceptional work here in Southern California at all different levels and um, contributing and hopefully bringing to life a, a really great conversation about what the future of residential architecture is. So uh, maybe I'll leave it to Alice to maybe introduce herself and share a little bit about her firm and we'll kind of work our way this way. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Alice of John Friedman Alice Kim Architects. People call us JFAK. Um, and we're located in Los Angeles and we do a range of work, including single family residential. Um, we work on the spectrum of residential from um, condominium projects and apartment buildings to, so multifamily, to single family, as well as um, work for, on behalf of the homelessness population. So we're very excited to be here, or I'm very excited to be here. Hi, uh, happy to be here. My name is Bryn Garrett with EYRC Architects. Uh, we're based out of Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, we work in all market sectors, but we primarily uh, work in residential, single family, multifamily. Um, and so we're really excited to kind of share our experience in working in the uh, future of the single family residential market. And uh, I'm David Paskew with Abramson Architects. Really excited to be here today. Um, our, our firm's in Los Angeles. We also have an office in San Diego. And we work in a lot of different sectors. Um, I'm in charge of the, the residential studio. Uh, we do single family residential. We also do multifamily. And um, in the multifamily sector specifically right now, we're doing a lot of remodels, which is kind of a, like an interesting project type. So happy to be here. Yeah. Well, I think we're, we're all happy to have you as part of this forum, too. I couldn't imagine a better group of architects here being part of this conversation, which is um, actually pretty fascinating. I know when we had a chance to talk a few weeks ago and just kind of kicking around some ideas, it really got me thinking, and I'm excited to kind of maybe share a little bit of those conversations with the, with the rest of the audience here. Um, I think as we just kind of kick it off, one of the first questions, I mean, I think just kind of starting is acknowledging that we're presumably coming out of the fog of the pandemic, what are each of you seeing as far as trends and things that, as architects, especially within this sphere, that are continuing to move forward? Obviously, the, the obvious things are work from home, there's lifestyle components, there's client priorities. But in addition to that or beyond that, maybe starting with you, Alice, what are you seeing as things that we're starting to take moving forward even as we continue to normalize, if, if we can say that? 
And focusing on single family residential, right? Yes. So, I mean, I think, um, I think increased emphasis on outdoor spaces and how to make use of them. So how to take your backyard, or if you don't have a backyard, a terrace, and actually turn that into a workspace or an eating space or a social space. Um, I think that just increasing the flexibility of the home is just become super, super key. Yeah, are you seeing those same things? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about this moment. I think a lot of our clients coming out of the pandemic have, uh, are more in tune with kind of the impact that the physical environment of their house has on their mental well-being, physical well-being. And so where before we kind of had to do a lot of convincing, I think, about a lot of the features that we're adding for their mental well-being, now it's more like the clients are asking for it. Uh, so it's a lot easier to kind of get things into the project that are either resourceful, not red list materials, or it could be um, renewable energy. These are all things that we're seeing now are kind of becoming standard and expectations of our clients um, because they're spending more waking hours at the home. I mean, they're there all the time. Right. So. Yeah. How about and you, David? Everyone needs a good Zoom backdrop, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you look at people on camera and you're like, okay, what can I put? They're talking, but what's behind them? What does that say about them and their, their lifestyle? And those are, that's super important. Sound isolation is important. Right. Um, you know, those are some kind of obvious ones, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a new world, right? It's a new right. world, and, um, you know, it takes, it takes a long time for lifestyles to change and then for people to, you know, pick up on that. And from, you know, we have to interpret that into the way that we design their home. Right. Yeah. I, I think picking up, Bryn, on what you were mentioning, you know, one of the things that we're seeing, too, and maybe to have you comment further about it, is just that notion of health and wellness. And I would say before the pandemic, a lot of that was discretionary, right? It would be great to have a gym. It would be great to have those things, but it's not critical. There are so many other things that I think by and large in our industry and clients' agendas that were, you know, are more priorities. But um, maybe you can speak a little bit more to just kind of what you're seeing, especially in the notion in the area of wellness and clients programming, prioritizing that specifically and not, not, not necessarily being a discretionary item or it, it's a must-have. Yeah, I mean, I think there's often been a conception that, um, a misconception that all of those features would be expensive or added cost over what they had budgeted in mind. But I think now we're at the point where technology, it's no more expensive to kind of make a house work better for your mental or right. physical wellness. Um, I think... One, one example recently that's been, been affecting a lot of people in California is, is this in, indoor uh, air quality. And, you know, if you're trapped in your home for a couple of days because of smoke or wildfire smoke, you know, are you able to do that? Are you able to seal yourself up and kind of live in there healthily? And um, so I think we're starting to see with our mechanical systems that they have to support people uh, in different ways than they did before. Um, yeah. Can I um, just jump in on something that sure. David was talking about? Because I think design-wise, I think the acoustics thing is actually really key. Mm. Because so many homes now, especially modern contemporary homes, are very open a lot of times. And right. of course, we want to take advantage of the climate, so the inside, outside. But when you have more people at home working and trying to Zoom simultaneously, then the acoustics issue does become a real issue. So, I mean, I'm, I would love to hear David actually talk a little bit more about... Um, kind of strategies that you've used to sort of mitigate yeah. acoustic issues in your designs right now? Because I think it's, that's, that's a challenge. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, early in the pandemic, we did, you know, kind of like a little, within our studio, a little, um, you know, design prototype for a house for the pandemic. And, you know, for me, it was the big thing was having like these little, these little pods <laughs> that were had sound isolation, but that, you know, you could still look in and see, because, you know, at that point, you know, kids were still in school, but they were doing school from home, and that was just an absolute disaster, especially for the really young kids. It's like, how do you even, because you have to supervise them, right. but then, you know, if you have two or three, it becomes impossible, so, you know, those, those are the kind of things that we were, we were thinking about. Yeah, I think we all work uh, with pretty open floor plans in our houses, and people love that. I mean, that's why they turn to modern architecture. But, uh, yeah, how you deal with acoustics and with an open floor plan, keeping it open, but providing, you know, multiple niches or nooks for people to work 
in an acoustic. Yeah, the, flexibi the flexibility is really key. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think flexibility, I, I agree. And I think this kind of leads to one of the things that you were men mentioning before, uh, um, Alice, in, in our conversation is just that notion of resiliency and kind of a generational. And again, people being a little bit more intentional and thoughtful about the fact that if they're doing and designing homes for themselves, it's not really just for today or for their immediate family, but how does this thing evolve for the next generation as the kids become older? Maybe you could speak a little bit to that. I mean, it's, um, so I work with my husband, That's and when we were at home um, during the early days of the pandemic with our three children who were all at home and the oldest one's boyfriend was living with us as well. So there were basically oh six of us <laughs> trying to have meetings and go to school and do all of these things. And it did become really an issue. Um, yeah. So in terms of resiliency, I mean, I, I just think... I think we started looking actually at commercial products, for instance, like furniture. Hmm. How can furniture start to help us in, in rearranging spaces to provide more of the acoustic privacy and things that we're looking at? Because I think actually creative office design uses a lot of the strategies that contemporary homes can use in design now to kind of help, you know, jump, jump that gap. And so... Um, but I think the, the wellness factor, you know, just having windows that are in the right place and all of those things. So I think sustainability and resiliency really kind of, it goes back to what Bryn was talking about, just having an understanding that a lot of these things which are passive techniques right. are so critical. Um, and actually, yes, clients are so much more receptive to taking on this challenge with us now, so. Right. I think one of the things that you just mentioned there, which is really interesting, is, and I, I would say is very great given the diversity of the work, is that even though you're both, you, you do residential, you have commercial, other experience, multifamily in there, to what degree do you draw on that within your firms and the work that you do, the things that are outside of residential design um, that influence resiliency in terms of material selection, in terms of how we lay out a, a modern floor plan, but in a different, more sustainable way? Are there things that you're seeing that kind of cross those specific residential, commercial, multifamily silos? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's, uh, we're pretty evenly distributed across those market sectors. You know, like kind of a third of, of the projects are residential, a third are commercial. So there's always that kind of cross with staff and ideas. I think the things that we learn from the commercial work is things about economies of scale and so, sort of more of the material and technology, whereas with the houses, there's this kind of um, constant reminder from our commercial clients that they want their office spaces to feel more like residential right. projects. Yeah. And so that's always interesting. Uh, and we love to take that as an opportunity to have you know, staff that often work on res projects kind of come over and, and give some ideas on the commercial work. Right. Um, I think now we're definitely in the, in the, in the res work um, with supply chain issues and labor issues during the pandemic, we had to turn to some more commercial tactics in terms of getting projects back online and getting them finished. Mm. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there's always that cross uh, interdisciplinary kind of influence on our residential yeah. work. And then David, same as you, I, Aberson, and how does that affect kind of the, the specific <coughs> well, work you're doing in the residential studio? Y yeah, well, um, you know, the, the interesting crossover is with some of the amenity spaces that are uh, designed in, in multifamily. I mean, you see, People are, you know, and it could be a really large community that has, you know, like podcast studios. I mean, Josh <laughs> right. could do a podcast from, you know, one of these uh, yeah. residential communities. So um, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the variety of, of what you see out there and also with, you know, technology yeah. um, is, is, really, is really interesting and kind of, you know, can shape the way we think about single family, too. Right, right. Uh, that's great. The... I think, you know, in, in conjunction with resiliency, we talk a lot about just sustainability, right? And, and to the degree that it has a similar track, and, and in particular here in Southern California, as, you know, with the case of global warming and, and other things, um, to what degree or what, what influences and impacts are you seeing in the kind of work that we do and ultimately moving forward? Alice. <laughs> Can you rephrase the question a little bit? Yeah, in terms of sustainability, sust sustainability, climate, um, all those things that were influenced, especially here in Southern California. Are there things that are 
part of that conversation, a dynamic that are influencing specifically how you approach your work in terms of addressing this? I mean, I guess, um, actually this is kind of a, a pet subject and it's also kind of a, you know, a pet kind of peeve, if you will. <laughs> but, you know, sustainability, it's kind of, um, it used, you know, 10 years ago, I think sustainability was like, everybody was using that word. It was like the S word, right? And right. It, was, um, it, was, it was really this kind of thing that was sort of a mandate and you would do as much of it as you can. But now it's kind of in all of our DNA, I think. So it's not, I think, I think we're all now trained, all of us in this room are just trained to design sustainably, period. And I think, you know, that's a good thing. So now then, what, what's the next thing? What's the next thing after that sort of that basic layer of where we use our intelligence and just knowledge and just understanding of um, passive techniques? And then, right. and then if we have enough money, we start to incorporate equipment as we can. It's basically until your budget says you can't do anymore. So then what's, what's kind of the next thing? And I think the next thing is actually... <laughs> It's actually more about um, building an entire community. If, you, if it's your house, then it's, it's your family and the extended community who comes to your house to sort of um, have a kind of a common attitude towards this thing that we call sustainability. So I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I think that the whole public mindset that, you know, that has to do with an understanding of global warming and just where the earth is going and, you know, whether we're even going to survive for another four or five generations, right? I think that's, I think it's kind of a universal mindset. I think that's what is, uh, that we're moving towards. And um, I think that that's affecting anybody who's designing or has commissioned a design whether you're middle class and you want a 1,000 square foot bungalow and you hire your architect or you have a little bit more means and you hire somebody to design your 15,000 square foot final family home. I think it's this kind of universal attitude now, if that makes sense. I mean, I would love yeah. to hear no, what you guys I, yeah. have to say. Well, and, yeah. and I was going to say the, you know, the re resiliency at the high end for people that are, you know, say, building outside of the cities, you know, they, they, they want to have, you know, maybe it's a second or third home, they're, they're building outside. The resiliency is almost um, like, a, like a, it's part of, you know, having a luxury property. It's like right. you, want it, you want to make sure that it's going to weather the storm, whatever that is, you know, and that could be a hurricane if you're depending on your location. It could be fires, it could be, it could be anything. So, you know, I'm seeing that more and more at the high end, like, clients really want that you know that's like it's sort of their ground zero yeah it's like, yeah yeah maybe, maybe talk a little bit more about that David I think that's a you know a very interesting idea and I, I think kind of hits a little bit of what we were mentioning before there's certain things in the past that were discretionary and there's things now where they're not necessarily discretionary or they're just part of the DNA or the, the fact that as responsible architects working in the sphere that we do and having an obligation to the client that these aren't negotiable it's just how we do so, given to kind of what you just mentioned there, are there specific examples that you've kind of done that are not discretionary, not for... Well, for I think it sort of changed the style of the home a little bit because, um, you know, clients are okay with, okay, let's build a concrete house. That's going to that's gonna be safe from fires. That's going to be, um, you know, more resilient and, and from certain storms and things like that. Or let's, let's elevate the house. Let's make sure that, you know, if there's some kind of, uh, I don't know, earth movement or slide or something that happens or, you know, debris flow, you, you can be safe from that. Um, so, uh, you know, it comes a little bit out of fear. Like people are looking around the world and they're like, oh my gosh, look what happened over there. I don't want that to happen right. to my property. So, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I think um, resiliency for, for all three of us, it sounds like it has become one and the same with sustainability. I think um, we're finding clients wanting coming to us wanting their projects to be sustainable, wanting them to survive, you know, long-term sea level rise, for instance, we're working in the bay and there's a lot of projects now that have to float. I mean, <laughs> they have to be able to, to raise off the ground about five feet to deal with long-term sea level rise or even annual storm events. So there's an opportunity there where the, the client wants to be resilient, they're willing to pay for that and go through the, the, the approval hurdles to get there. Um, but at the same time, you're also able to maybe save on carbon um, and, right. they, and so now we're at this juncture where 
the two can work together. Um, and we found, like, we just did a house on the coast where we had to reuse the foundations. And for the client, that meant the project could be built in a, you know, in a year versus two years uh, based on the approval process. But we were able to eliminate re-pouring a concrete foundation that would have added so much carbon to that project. So I think resiliency has led to us as, as kind of a, a key way to convince clients to be more sustainable without them necessarily yeah. and, being and kind of aware premium, of it. so to speak, of it, yeah. yeah. And it's kind of the, like the time that you design for. Are you building a, you know, a house that's going to last 30 years or 50 right. years or 80 years or 100 years? Right. It's more, if it lasts 100 years, it's, it's sustainable. It's exciting, yeah. I was also just going to say one thing about um, if you're building a house in the city um, and when you're thinking about urban sustainability and what that means because you know we kind of have to start looking at increasing density of course in our cities and that means that houses um, not just get maybe have to get smaller but that they have to start stacking up and I think that sort of does lead to this idea of multi-general multi-generational resiliency also um, you know, my, our family, we actually built a house um, that was finished a few years ago, and one of the things that we did was that we made sure that every level, it's on a hillside, every level actually could be a standalone apartment. Wow. So, and this was just, um, and, it, and it wasn't so much an intellectual exercise as actually thinking very deeply about our own children and kind of what the future might hold, and I don't mean to, mean to be some doomsayer, but, you know, <laughs> a lot of, you know, a lot of um, kids, they're getting out of college, they're coming back home, you know, it just makes a lot of sense in many ways for multiple generations to live together, that's certainly still true in many cultures, and so it was kind of thinking about that and um, thinking about how this kind of multi-level house could actually function as one unified house or as actually three separate apartments. Right. So um, I think resiliency, so there's that kind of resiliency as well, kind of looking at density. But there's, and, then, and then one thing I would love to hear other opinions about is kind of cultural resiliency as well. Right. I mean, <laughs> I think that's sort of an interesting one. Without getting into it, I'm just going to throw that term out there and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Dave, Bryn? Cultural resiliency. Yeah, well, I, I think we, as, as a firm, we don't, every time we start a project, it's, it takes so much time to kind of understand the client, understand wh how they're trying to live. And so part of that is obviously uncovering the cultural history, things that we can draw inspiration upon. And so, yeah, I think the, the cultural resiliency for us would be baking those things, allowing them to live that, um, that lifestyle that they envision for themselves. Um, and they kind of come to us to make that happen. But I think, um, I was just reading that about a third, I think, of the dwelling units being constructed in California now are ADUs, right. thanks to the laws. Which is great. Um, and so that's interesting in terms of generational resilience, and I think a lot of our clients expect family to live in those ADUs at some point. Right. Um, and so that's, that's always a requirement now. Usually it's a house and an ADU um, along right. with it. Yeah. And, you know, the changes in the economy are going to have changes in, eventually will change families, like the way that families choose to live together. You yeah. know, the, the, when I grew up, you're expected to leave the house and, you know, <laughs> go find, you know, some, <laughs> somewhere else to live. But I think, uh, with, you know, as the economy changes more and more, you, you know, kids are coming, they're going to come back home. You know, I think that's, I've got three kids. I'm I don't know. I hope they can do, but you know, it's uh, they may come back, and then we'll, we'll yeah. have to find a place for them. Yeah, I, I I love this idea. It you know as a new concept, just the idea of generational resiliency. It, it kind of segues even the panel that we just had here before, where a lot of it was about repurposing, recycling, and 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 especially in this day and age, I think that we all probably would agree. You know, we're basically a consumer-driven society, and so if it's not new, then it's probably not good. But, you know, are there things nowadays that we're doing generationally? Or maybe, again, it's just a new wave of our clients that is now starting to appreciate and see great value in reusing and reusing a foundation. It doesn't have to be new. You know, is there, is there efficiencies or cost or, a, or just a different connection that somebody has to the process by, by really valuing things that don't necessarily have to be brand new? And, and I think that's a, that's a really interesting idea. 
Um, one of the threads that I think all three of you guys were mentioning in terms of resiliency is, uh, and maybe as a segue to, which is our clients. I mean, none of this is possible without our clients. It all starts with our clients. And I think in most cases with residential design, we're working with pr uh, private clients that are oftentimes eccentric and have different goals or ambitions um, and different aspirations for what they're doing. Um, what are each of you seeing in particular in terms of how this next generation of clients is changing what we're doing given what their goals and aspirations are? And maybe starting with you, David. Um, gosh, I don't know. That's a tough one. If you guys want to jump in. I'll... I, I can start if you want. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing that comes to mind now, a lot of the clients come to us, they either have their own company or they're part of a company that's uh, very involved in you know, visualization, technology, AI, what have you. Their expectations are that during the design process, they've never built a house before, many of them, that they're going to be kind of plugged in and they're going to know what everything looks like before it's built. Until re relatively recently, it was very hard to show them accurately what it was going to look like. Right. Um, or there was you know, half the project that wasn't modeled or visualized and they had just had to use their imagination. So now we have the tools that we can manage those expectations, but also open the door to the clients and they feel like they're a lot more part of the process. So whether that's real-time rendering in Enscape or you know, VR where they're actually using right. muscle memory to, to experience the scale of their home, um, we're finding that bringing the client into the fold is a lot easier now with the yeah. technology that we have. Yeah. What are you saying, Alice? I was just gonna say, I totally agree in that that's not just for residential clients, it's for everybody, maybe that's what you meant. Um, I do think it's a little bit um, interesting though as designers running firms and running businesses, how far we let that go. Right. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, for me anyway, just being honest, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's hard to sometimes draw the line between remembering that, you know, well, you hired us because we have a certain level of expertise and we have, um, um, we have something that we can offer you and do we have to show you every little thing, every step of the way. I mean, I'm just being really honest because it is actually very, very time consuming. Um, but it is, um, it makes the process, yes, so much more interactive and so much more participatory. And in that way, it's very, very exciting. Um, but I, I think that there's still that kind of aha thing that happens when the thing is actually under construction. And right. it is still different than the rendering was or the animation was. And so we still have, there's still a little bit of that gap that we still have to figure out how yeah, to the, leap over. I, I mean, the, the big thing is the materials because now you can just, you can map materials onto a model. We had a, a meeting last week with a client where the first time they were seeing something in 3D and I tried really hard, like, don't put materials, don't put materials, <laughs> don't put materials. But we still ended up with some materials and uh, you know, now we're developing that further but as good as the renderings are, it's not the same as seeing it in real life. I mean, materials just, they change so much with, you know, as the light moves and, right. and they're tactile and there's just, you know, yeah. it's, it's a little dangerous. I agree with you, Alice. It's kind of, it's <laughs> yeah, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, yeah, 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 I was just going to add, coming out of COVID, there was a lot of, um, a lot of challenges managing expectations with clients. I think yeah. not only was it a first time them building a house, which is hard for a lot of clients, but um, you know, they, there were a lot of unknowns thrown in with labor shortages and, and supply chain issues. And so I felt like it was, a, it was our job as architects to, to more closely manage that experience right. during COVID. Um, and I think we learned a lot of ways to, to kind of bring clients along in a more engaging manner um, because we were forced to, because right. they were, we, we didn't want them to have a bad impression yeah. of building considering the, the circumstances. Right. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you feel that that's been the most challenging aspect of client management expectations post-COVID or maybe even beforehand, or maybe it's just done differently, but we're realizing and seeing it differently given all the dynamics? Yeah, I think seeing it differently given all those dynamics and, yeah. um, you know, the tools obviously make it them more aware of the design as it's moving along. And so, yes, we, we give them a model that they can fly around with on their own if they want to, and we usually get a call like, oh, we found this object in this room over here. Uh, didn't, didn't get presented at I the last that meeting. Was just what us. is this? Good to hear it's other people are going through that as well. I mean, the thing is, like, 
for so many of our clients, this is the most money they're going to spend on right. anything. And it's really kind of this, the, the, their home. I mean, it's the crucible of like their dreams and their lives. And so, I mean, it's a huge, hefty responsibility. And so I think that's where it becomes um, an interesting and also, you know, very important challenge, you know, how to actually figure out how to communicate this is the degree to which we can show you what it's really going to be like, and the rest you just have to wait. You know, I mean, it's right. it's 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 hard. And I think post COVID, really, the hardest thing for us to, to manage with respect to our clients is the cost, yeah. because the costs have escalated so much. I mean, it's just like even we who are in the industry are are just like our mouths we're, are we're just falling shocked. open yeah. every day. I mean, I just it's just impossible to comprehend. So I think that's also, um, it's very, very tough right now to deal with right. the whole cost reality yeah. of construction. So so how do you deal with that? I, I know there's not a silver bullet answer in there, but I know that we probably all go through that. I know we talk about that a lot at our firm, but how do you manage that level of transparency or at least having the client feel like they're in control of the budget, which I think most of the times we've seen where clients kind of go sideways is, is when they don't feel like they're in control of the budget, that they're forced upon that and why did that happen? So are there kind of tricks of the trade that you're learning or ways to manage client expectations on that front? Yeah, I think in the last uh, couple of years, we've turned to new forms of um, construction, fabrication, trying to find new partners to construct houses in a different way that's more controlled. Right. Um, so we've actually looked at uh, 3D printing houses mm. as well as prefab, modular, and panelized. Wow. Um, we've had... I mean, again, you have to kind of separate it from the, the impacts of the pandemic, but they were challenging because a lot of those contractors are not set up for custom homes, extremely bespoke details. Right. They just, it has to be more of a mass produce, produced uh, product. Yep. So we're still exploring. We haven't, I don't think we've necessarily found su success at scale, but we're looking at all different ways of of building these homes to, to right. help our clients. And to limit the moving dynamics of costs. Yeah. yeah. Are you seeing yeah. the same thing, David, in terms of? Yeah, I mean, we're, we definitely, like I've been shocked by some of the prices that <laughs> I've seen post pandemic. Um, and so I think, I think the key is, you know, bringing in some outside help to estimate costs. And, right. you know, share that with your clients and then give them options that are within their budget. Right, yeah. Well, I think one of the most important things is to at your very first meeting to actually bring it up as a, as a thing um, and just to actually have that um, tough discussion about what the cost climate looks like, how sort of uncertain it is right now, but there are all these things that are out there that are worth exploring. Um, so at least, you know, two months down the line when you give them a first idea of cost, it's not the first time they're hearing about it. Right. Um, so sort of setting the stage to gently kind of break them into it. I think I think that's really important, you yeah. know, because that way they're partners from the very beginning. I mean, it is their money, so. Right. Yeah, and, and, and one of the things that we do, at least internally to that, uh, Alice, is, you know, we tell each of our clients, every time we do something, it's a prototype. Generally, it's not something we've done before. It's a horrible way to run a business, <laughs> to do a prototype every single time and to assume that you're going to build some efficiency or consistency or... Um, a, a clear understanding of what that budget is because we're generally doing it for the first time given all the different dynamics and, and that at least helps soften the blow but I, I, I think from our experience, I mean similar to what it sounds like you guys are saying, a lot of it is just training the clients up front that this is a variable, it's not an exact science and that there's a lot of different factors that, uh, that are going to influence their ability to manage their budget but you know, as long as we're able to kind of be great stewards of that. So. Um, Jumping subjects a little bit, uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, I mean, by and large, we've kind of assumed that, and we're, I think we're fairly privileged to be able to work for kind of the, the well-to-do, you know, where maybe budget isn't necessarily a significant issue, although, you know, obviously it's, it's a component to the project, but, um, you know, given the socioeconomic class or, or conversations around low-income housing, there's also the, the conversation around middle class, designing for the middle class. And, um, you know, for most of us, they're actually probably on, on this stage. Um, what are your impressions of that, Alice? I know that you've got some experience, at least observations, in terms of, you know, issues and challenges that we confront in, in terms of residential design and where we're going about giving middle class the accessibility to good design. I mean, I think one of the, the, the 
great things that's happened is that just the level of residential design overall has really risen. Um, um, good design is no longer just for the wealthy or the upper crust, it's actually much more accessible. And I think in our conversation, we had a conversation a few weeks ago and we were talking about you know, Dwell Magazine and how Dwell Magazine and other design magazines actually really brought good design to the kind of consciousness of the public and how important this actually was. Um, so I think, you know, me, I personally want to see everybody, you know, everybody in, the, in, 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 in everybody just have access to good design. And I think that takes a lot of education. Um, but I think that good design is not it's not limited. It, it can, good design is available to any kind of project, right? right? And I think that's the fundamental thing. So you can design really good spaces for any kind of user group. Um, and it's true that you may not be able to use the same level of finishes or the same, you know, the, all this great equipment and all of this stuff, but you can still make great spaces. And right. so that's, I think, um, the really important thing for me to remember always, um, we do a lot of work for LADWP. Mm -hmm. And their whole thing is, you know, we want to bring all of this residential technology to the single family home for the middle class. So their model is the California bungalow. It's 1,000 square feet, it has two bedrooms and one bath, and it has all of the latest technological features in the kitchen and the bathroom, and it's very sustainable and efficient, has great lighting. Um, so I always kind of remember that as the model because I think that the principles that we all use to design a 20,000 square foot house, which we haven't done yet, but <laughs> too, and or a 1,000 square foot bathroom, you know, bathroom, my God, um, is the same. You know, the principles are the same. So I guess I'll just stop there and let no, you yeah. go. Yeah, I think it's it's been rewarding for us to work in the multifamily uh, or multifamily housing because of the... Um, I mean, I guess the amenity space is the community that you're, you're creating a community right. and you, you, there's so many more design opportunities there. Um, I think that Excite, you know, our staff, they want to work on both, really. They'd love to kind of jump back between single family and multifamily. Um, I think one thing I mentioned earlier about finding new ways to construct these homes is really it's about getting better design to the middle class. Um, and you're seeing the other prefab products out there, and it's like, well, they're being made in the same factory, but one definitely took kind of a, a deeper look at, at the design and how it was going to support the families and the owners of these places. So, um, yeah, I think that for us, it's, it's, it's just as rewarding, if not more so. Um, right. Do you, do you see prefab as a key track to be able to unlock greater accessibility for middle class, if potentially even you know, low income housing? I think so. I mean, the, the added benefit is you're, you're working in a controlled environment um, and you're also building these in places where there's lower labor costs, but you're supporting, you're supporting those communities. So you right. no longer, I mean, San Francisco is so constrained in, in terms of build, building market, you really can't add or get more builders in there and so one way to alleviate that is to build them elsewhere in a factory and then obviously ship them in. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I think we're excited by, um, you know, addressing the, the, the hot topic right now, which is the, the housing issue in California. So. Yeah, yeah. What do you see, David? Yeah, and I, I kind of wanted to jump back to Bryn's comment about the amenities spaces in, in multifamily communities. and. You know, I've, I've had the interesting experience now in working on a few that were originally designed in the late 60s, early 70s. And so, you know, they have swimming pools, but the, the, uh, the gym, they don't really have gyms. You know, nobody cared about gyms. So there's, um, you know, pool halls. Like, they have places where you can play pool. So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to see how, you know, changes in lifestyle have affected the the demands of, you know, for those amenity spaces and how, how those are changing. Um, so I, I see a lot of opportunity there because, you know, like you said, that's, it, it's more opportunity to build community, which I think was yeah, really well said. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I mean, even from our experience, we, there was a time where we dabbled in prefab as well. Um, uh, we did a few things called home units that uh, 
That, but to your point, it was really to be able to provide greater access to the middle class because you can control that labor and construction costs a lot more so, which is the greatest dynamic right now. It's, it's the wild west in terms of cost and in terms of how to manage that um, is, is a big challenge. But I, I think to what everybody just mentioned here, it makes a lot of sense. Um, design technology in regards to AI, the hot new subject now. What are you guys, where, where are you on that? You know, I, I think it's been interesting to kind of hear AI obviously infiltrates so many parts of kind of all industries right now in modernization and efficiency. Um, in terms of what we do as architects or even more specifically residential architects, how are you seeing that integrate your particular practices and in influencing your work? Um, any particular go-tos or particular points of view that you might have and render your smile a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a hot topic and I think it's, it's more our um, younger staff that keep bringing up AI and its yeah. role in our practice. I, th I don't see many of our clients coming to us actually and, and discussing AI and saying, you know, I came, I went home this weekend and I, I searched up on mid-journey what a house may look like if it was designed by you guys. <laughs> Um, why do I need you anymore? Uh, no, I think... It's coming. Uh, yeah, we want to get ahead of it, and I right. think it's working with AI and finding ways it can take over some really mundane um, parts of, of documenting a project, and, um, and that way we can focus more on the fun stuff. Right. So we're not turning away from it. I think we're using it less as a, um, like an image generator and more yeah. as, a, as a kind of administrative aid to, to, to allow us to, to do more design work. Right, um, yeah. yeah. Are you finding different strategic, strategic ways as well, David? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really using it myself that much, but I'm, you know, seeing, I'm noticing developers using it. So there's, huh. there's software out there that can, you know, look, search. It can take all the information from city zoning codes and search the city and find properties that are... Um, you know, ripe for development and then ripe for a specific type of development and then even generate, you know, four or five versions of how something could be masked at that property. So, right. you know, I think to your point, like the things that would have otherwise been mundane or, or it, it allows things to be searched on mass, which is a powerful tool. So it's, yeah. it's just using it as, a, it's another tool. It's just using do you it. still, do you both see it as a positive at this point versus something to be feared or... Yeah. In its current capacity, it seems okay, but yes, there's some fear of... <laughs> you have seen Terminator, right? <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think that's a great example. Test, running test fits is something that um, can, can get you a head start with AI, and then you can kind of take it from there. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, I see enormous potential in what you guys were saying in terms of it just, you know, taking on a lot of that upfront, you know, just complete not mindless, but, you know, just generic work that we have to do, and I think that's a really great thing. I mean, a funny story is that I was in a meeting, and, you know, one person took notes, meeting notes, mm -hmm. using AI, and, and then um, another person took notes by hand, based on what they were hearing, and at the end of it, we, were, we, we all compared them and took a vote, but there was no vote, because, you know, like, the AI notes, like, it captured everything including the stuff that nobody wants in the meeting minutes, right? Nobody wants them because they're compromising to somebody. So, Who talked I mean, the most and uh, yeah, exactly. the mood, the tone of your voice. That's right, exactly. And, you know, <laughs> this person bitched at this person. And, um, but I do think that, I mean, if we can harness it to just increase our efficiency so that we can focus on design right. and AI architect can focus on all the other stuff and the picking out the right door details from our library and all that, that's amazing, right? So right. anyway, I'm kind of excited by it and scared. Yeah. Um, what would each of you say is the biggest threat or challenge to our business right now? Is there anything that you look at and... How is the are we allowed to say? <laughs> <laughs> Three, no. What's the top of mind? What's, what's the first thing that usually comes up Monday morning or end of the week where you just kind of shake your head? I, don't, I mean, cost of construction is just, I mean, that's really putting a hamper on a lot of, all of our clients moving forward with projects. Yeah. Um, I think even the ones that are sort of immune to, to market fluctuation feel like if they're not getting good value for their dollar, then they still don't want to build. Right. So, yeah, I'd say that's really um, the crux of a lot of the, the issues that we have it right now. Um, I would add, though, that like things like 
code. I think there's yeah. been big improvements in code that get us um, very far in terms of performance of our houses now. I think a lot of the recent projects that we completed, we've seen that they've achieved you know, net zero you know, quite easily energy right. just by following code. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, there's, usually that was bit our big complaint, but now I think it's cost of construction has been. Yeah, um, yeah. What's top of mind, David, as far as? Well, I, I guess I'm thinking, so, you know, to go off of cost of construction, I'm thinking cost of labor. Yeah. Um, you know, even within the design community, you know, we're constantly getting people are proposing, hey, uh, you know, we can do all your CDs from India or, and, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I guess there's, you know, there's something there, but um, I think the more that that disperses and becomes less localized, I think it's a little right. bit dangerous. Um, so, you know, you said threat, so that's, yeah. what, you know, that's what I kind of, yeah, you're saying I go there. with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would agree about the cost of construction. Um, I guess a little bit, on a little bit more philosophical um, note in terms of, again, just coming back to building in our cities and building housing and the incredible need that we have to house so many people now. Um, and what I worry about is uh, just the kind of, as the quality of design in general has gone way up and aided by all of these things that we've been talking about, I think that um, the emphasis on cheap and fast is just right. taking over. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's taking over for good reasons. It's taking over because we have so many people who need to be housed and all this other stuff. But I, you know, I do worry about like what are our cities going to look like as a result in 100 years and the quality of that. So I think that one of the biggest responsibilities we have, I don't even know if I would call it, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, I think it's a responsibility as, as architects is to actually just kind of make sure that we never lose sight of that mm -hmm. as, a, as a whole, as an industry, and just make sure that we ask ourselves tough questions and actually bring those tough questions to the people at the government level who are actually responsible for um, guiding us in our work to build all this stuff in our cities. So, because we right. would like to have great cities and, 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 and keep the evolution of them going at a nice, you know, in, you know continue to evolve in a good way. Right, so. right. And it, it is your sense that things are moving in the right direction in that arena, or is your observation that it's... No, I, I think my... There's a lot of work to be done. I think my point was that it's actually kind of going off kilter, yeah. partly because of our homelessness crisis and partly because of just cost co considerations. And so, you know, I mean, everybody, I think, in our industry, it's like you have, you have cost, you have time, and you have quality. You can have two, but you can't have all three. Right. I mean, I think that's a major problem. <laughs> so, you know, we don't want to lose sight of the quality, um, but we still want things fast and cheap. So if, if fast is going to be and cheap is going to be modular and prefab, um, how can we, you know, that's a potential that can solve this problem perhaps or challenge. But, uh, you know, I just, no, I think it's getting worse, actually, the problem <laughs> that I'm talking about. So. Yeah, it's a little alarming when some of these jurisdictions that haven't met their <laughs> their housing quota um, are, are now talking about how do we actually just get money to pay the fines as opposed to actually tackle the right. challenge. Um, and so we're seeing that in some Bay Area communities that the challenge of building the housing units is, is just so hard that they're, they'd rather pay the fine and, right. and, and move on. So yeah. um, how do we encourage them that it's make that process easier for them, for jurisdictions, right. to think that housing is the, the right answer? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think to what you're both saying, there's also a time component to that. I, I mean, even from our experience, one of the things that we talk a lot about is just the amount of time it takes to get through the jurisdictional approval process. It's, it's, it's a mile and a half, right? And there's some areas where, admittedly, we, we wouldn't even want to touch because you're in for six to eight years before you're even able to put shovels in the ground. And that's an, that's an aspect, especially, I think, from our observation, you know, post-COVID with city agencies, a lot of them flipping over, a lot of staff changing over, that there's less consistency. People that are in a position to be able to make a final approval. Everybody's kind of kicking it up the, the ladder or back down the ladder. And our clients are they're moving and shaking. They, they, you know, and it's, it's, it might potentially change the nature of what we're able to do because, you know, most people just don't have the patience for a six to 10 year project. They, you know, life is short. Their kids are going to graduate high school. They're going to be empty nesters. Yeah. 
they can't let this thing go along. So it's something that we're also monitoring as well, in addition to kind of a lot of things that you guys were mentioning. So um, as we're kind of coming up on our time here uh, and just kind of leaving this on a good note, um, what do you... <laughs> What do you each see as the most optimistic thing about the future of architecture, residential architecture? Is there something that, given the challenges that we just spoke about, that gets you out of bed and gets you to work and keeps you excited and puts a smile on your face? And maybe, David, starting with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that the, uh, you know, the, the pressures that we just talked about, really there's a pressure for density, right? Yeah. There, and, and that's not, that's not going to go away. Um, so I'm excited because I think that that gives rise to new lifestyles and then that gives rise to new typologies and so you know it's it's, gonna, it's our responsibility to kind of be able to come up with the the ideas that generate those new those new typologies that you know allow more people to live within tighter spaces and still maintain the health and wellness and, and all of the things that we've been talking about right. today all right now yeah, it's great yeah, I think there's something we started with is that we're um, seeing finally that being resourceful and resilient um, and sustainable as designers is now aligned with what our clients are looking for in terms of comfort and the support that the home can provide them. So I think we're, it, it just feels like we're, we're way more aligned with our clients after what we've right. gone through over the last couple of years. <laughs> we're on the same page and we're really trying to work towards the same solutions um, with these houses. And so that's exciting. Yeah. It's like less at odds and more, on you know, working page. together. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I guess um, in addition to what you both said, which I think I agree with wholeheartedly, I'm really interested in the potential of automation. Not uh, There's automation in the design process. There's automation in construction. There's also automation just in the home in general. And if the kind of... I once read that you know, this one guy who's a physicist, he wrote that the goal of automation in the future when looking 100 years down the line is so that we can all enjoy our lives more and, you know, have more leisure time. I mean, I don't know if I really agree with that, but I do think that the promise of automation in our homes, um, you know, gives rise to really exciting potential for, you know, just increasing creativity in other ways. And so I, I, I think that's that's the, uh, one of the things about, the, about home design that I get very excited about. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, thank you. Thank you, David, Bryn, Alice, for a great conversation. I think, you know, hopefully we all um, learned a lot here and just kind of getting three great perspectives from three leading architects here in Southern California. So on behalf of everybody, appreciate your time on this one. So thank, thank you. you. Josh, back to you.